G'day, I'm Paul. A little while back, we had a chance to check out the Mazda CX-90, but it was in pre-production form. We finally have our hands on an actual production version. I've spent a bit of time with this and I'm keen to get better understanding of whether it's worth the price tag they've put on it. So today I'll definitively answer that for you. This one here is the mid-spec, it's called the GT. This one is the diesel as well. So we're keen to see how this performs. Recently, we actually checked out the CX-60, which is the slightly smaller version of this. And you can watch that review by clicking up here. Now this is priced at just under $85 thousand dollars which is a big chunk of money but if that is too expensive the entire range kicks off at just under 74 grand this competes with things like the hyundai palisade uh, they want you to think that it competes with things like the xc90 and the q7 as well but we'll see whether that is the case today today we're going to do a detailed review of this car so if you do want to skip ahead to other parts of this review you can use the time codes that are on the screen or if you are on youtube you can scroll down and use the chapters below and please make sure you subscribe to our channel if you haven't done so already so you can find out every single time we review a new mazda Okay, so let's talk about exterior design. Start off with the colors. You've got a stack to choose from, and I haven't seen this color before. I think it looks sensational. It really just works well with uh, the variation of other colors you have on the car. So the black wheel arches and the black badges and stuff. I think it actually looks, looks really nice. And the vehicle itself actually looks really nice as well. You gotta keep in mind, this is just over five meters long. It's only marginally shorter than a BMW X7 but it doesn't look and feel big here in person, which I think is really important that you don't want to feel intimidated by the car that you're driving. Down here, you've got chrome highlights around that grille section, black in there. And then if you look behind there, you have active louvers as well that open and close depending on the vehicle's cooling requirements, parking sensors down the front there as well. And then an air dam down the bottom here for cooling. You have adaptive LED headlights with a little orange reflector there on the side, and then a tiny bit of aero down the side here as well whip around to the side here. So here you're gonna find 21 inch alloy wheels. It's a big old wheel, 45 profile tire, nice looking wheels as well. It's got sort of a bit of a graphite looking finish on it. And then you've got wheel arch cladding here as well. Has just over 200 millimeters of ground clearance, which isn't too bad for a vehicle this size. Uh, it isn't really off-road capable, but it is good to have just a little bit more ground clearance there if you do need it. Up the top here, you've got a badge there for inline six, both the petrol and diesel version of this are both six cylinders. They will be doing a plug-in hybrid version at some point down the track, which is uh, based on a different engine as well. So I'm keen to see how that goes as well. Up the top here, you have an indicator built into the wing mirror and a camera there for the 360 camera. A bit more chrome and black down the bottom section here. You do have a glass roof here as well. And then come around to the back with me. So, LED tail lights here. Love the look of those with that pulsing finish on the indicator. E Sky Active D, so D stands for diesel. E because this uses a mild hybrid system that I'll run you through when we go for a bit of a drive. And then CX90 all wheel drive because this is, in fact, all wheel drive. Um, outside of that, I think the design actually looks pretty good. Design is subjective, so some people don't like it, but I actually reckon it looks uh, pretty nice here. Let me know what you reckon in the comments section below. Do you think it's a good looking rig? Do you think it's a lot of money? I'm keen for your feedback. So we are inside the CX-90. Uh, this is what the key looks like. You've got a Mazda logo there, nothing on the front, and then you've got lock, unlock, boot, and it's a proximity sensing key, so you can leave that in your pocket. You have a start button just here. So what do we reckon about this? So this is 85 odd thousand dollars. You can spend over a hundred thousand dollars on these. Um, Look, I think it's it's nice, but to me, this doesn't really look all that spectacular for that price. And I'm talking about stuff like these materials. This kind of just looks, I don't know, just looks a little bit cheap. Same story over here on the doors. Some of this plastic is just a bit cheap and, and not very nice. So, um, yeah, I do like that they've gone to a bit of effort here to, to make the, the surfaces soft touch and, and that kind of thing. But... I just think it could look a little bit nicer for the price tag, especially when they want to be competing with things like uh, Q7, XC90. And XC90, despite its age, still actually feels significantly nicer inside than this does. So um, that is something worth keeping in mind. Um, outside of that, though, touch points, not too bad just there. Nice and soft. Soft on the door as well. How soft are they? We've got our durometer. We've tested the main surfaces in this cabin. If you want to see how this car compares to others that we've tested before, have a look at the link in the description below. Now, build quality. So it's made in Japan. What's it all like? Nice and solid there. It all feels pretty good. And this is what the door sounds like. 
Now let's talk about infotainment. So you've got two screens here. You've got the infotainment screen and also the screen ahead of the driver. So both measure 12.3 inches. Running through the screen ahead of the driver and the head up display in just a sec, but we'll start off over here. Now it's a really impressive screen because it's high resolution and it sits right where you want it to sit in terms of your eye line. It's not too low, it's not too high, it's sort of exactly where it needs to be. This also has a driver distraction monitor and that basically keeps an eye on you and, and makes sure you're not distracted and I'll explain why it's not very good uh, shortly. Um, outside of that, you control the infotainment screen down here using this iDrive-esque controller. It's not a touch screen, confusingly, but it is a touch screen in smartphone mirroring, but only when you're stationary. So. I know, it's a bit of a bit of a weird one, but um, uh, that is the way that works. In terms of the features, you have inbuilt satellite navigation. So that is, uh, it, it works even if you don't have a smartphone paired to it. But if you do want more accurate and I guess more up-to-date traffic, you can just pair a smartphone and it comes with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. So I'll jump on to Apple CarPlay here. So full screen integration wireless it's nice and quick there which is good and this is what android auto looks like same story again full screen uh, fairly responsive as well so that is all good on that front now in terms of radio you have a bose branded sound system am fm dab digital radio and it's a 12 speaker sound system pretty good sound system in my opinion uh, over ahead of the driver here so this screen i'm a big fan of it's high resolution which is good, but it is a little bit laggy at times. And you notice it with the rev gauge when the engine is turning off and on, it can just be a tiny bit laggy there in terms of how it works. I think that's just down to the refresh rate of the screen, but outside of that, it actually looks pretty good. You can then just change what appears on the screen. So using the info button, you can flick through the menus on the right-hand side. And then once you engage cruise control, it actually gives you a sort of idea of where the cars are ahead of you, which is pretty cool. Head-up display is great as well. Nice and big, very clear and, uh, easy to see through as well. Let's talk about safety. So you've got autonomous emergency braking with pedestrian and cyclist detection. It has a junction assist function. So if you try and turn across traffic, it'll slam the brakes on for you. You've got an auto dimming rear vision mirror, blind spot monitor built into the wing mirrors. I mentioned before the distraction camera. Look, it's fine because yeah, it'll tell you if you're distracted, but it actually tells you you're distracted when you're not distracted. And I find that highly annoying as well because then it defeats the purpose of that feature existing uh, in itself. And a lot of the other safety features are really frustrating as well. It's just constantly binging and buzzing and telling you that stuff's happening. It's trying to force the wheel out of your hand uh, when you get near a line. It really is just quite distracting and not very well refined. And we found the exact same thing with the CX-60. When we go for a bit of a drive, I'll see how it performs sort of here in, in these conditions. But yeah, just on the way out here today, just wasn't really overly impressed with all of that stuff. Uh, you've got radar cruise control. On the parking front, you have front and rear parking sensors and a 360 camera. I'll show you what that looks like. So that's your vision out the front. You can go wide angle and then you can also do side vision. And I'll show you what the reverse camera looks like. I'm gonna have to turn this on for a second. Pop it into reverse. There it is there. So the quality is pretty decent. I can clearly see what's written there on the suitcase. And then you can also adjust those views as you go as well. So yeah, not a bad setup. And this is what the horn sounds like. Now let's talk about practicality and we'll start off with your connectivity. So down here, you've got a wireless phone charger. You have a 12 volt outlet. In the center console here, you've got two USB-C ports. So where are you gonna store your phone? Well, you can whack it here in the uh, cup holders or you can pop it on the wireless phone charger. Speaking of cup holders, where are you gonna put your little coffee cup? So it goes in here fine and it's so we've got the right depth as well for a small coffee with teeth in there to hold your, your bottles and cups in place. Same story with sort of normal size bottle, also fits inside the door without any dramas. Does our big bottle fit though? Let's have a little look. Yes, it does, very impressive. Now, what about other stories? So down here near the driver's knee, you've got a little slot there for coins and keys and that type of thing. Center console though, randomly is tiny and it makes no sense because I don't think there's anything behind, like there must be something behind there, but it's just, it's very small for a vehicle this size and, a, and an opening that size as well. Down here, you've got yourself a pretty reasonably sized glove box and finally a sunglasses holder up the top. 
Now, what about your comfort? So you've got dual zone automatic climate control up the front here. You've got heated seats and a heated steering wheel. In terms of seat adjustment, you can go forwards, backwards. It's electric, by the way. Backrest goes forwards, backwards. Front of the seat goes up and down. Back of the seat goes up and down. You have electric lumbar adjustment as well. Uh, the seats themselves are fairly comfortable. Um, sort of did a fair highway drive to get here and you know, they're a little bit firm, but uh, I'm keen to see what it feels like over a longer distance drive uh, to see whether they retain that. Passenger seat is electrically adjustable as well. And on the steering front, it goes up and down, in and out, and that's all electrically adjustable. In terms of the reach test, uh, all of this stuff is easy to reach. The screen though, if you do need to use the touch portions of it, it is a little bit of a stretch away and it is a little more difficult to touch it uh, while you're driving. But like I said, once you're moving, none of the touchscreen functionality works anyway. Okay, so second row, I wanna show you something. Have a look at this. The doors open almost 90 degrees. We saw that in the CX-60 as well and I found it was really uh, good for getting my little one in when I had the baby seat in there. So um, that is great news. Uh, in terms of room, have a look at this. Loads of knee room. Toe room is excellent. Uh, headroom is pretty good as well. In terms of your creature comforts back here, you've got USB-C charging ports, uh, another zone of climate control and heated seats for the outboard seats, and then air vents as well. It is kind of strange there isn't any storage room in there when there isn't really much going on here outside of these air vents. So I think it's probably a bit of a wasted opportunity there and they could have used that space a little bit better. Uh, you've got map pockets in the back of the seats. You have ISO fix points on the two outboard seats with uh, top tether points along here as well. Center armrest there with two cup holders. You've got these curtains here if you want to stop the sun coming in. And then you can also slide this row forwards and backwards to give you a bit more room for the third row, which we'll check out in a second. And then our window test, it's auto up and down. Does it go all the way down? No, not quite, unfortunately. Okay, so third row, let's see what it's like. Uh, I know that with most of these things, the third row is just for kids, but given this is Mazda's biggest car, uh, I wanna see what it's like for adults. So uh, to get in, you've got a button down here that brings the seat forward and allows you to slide it through. So let's see how we go. Okie dokie. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna bring uh, this seat all the way back just so we can see what it's like to start with. Uh, actually, can't really go any further back than that. Um, but you know what, oh, it's actually not too bad. So I've got uh, okay toe room. It is a little wedged under there, but it's it's not too bad. Knee room is perfectly fine. Uh, Sean, I might get you to get a shot of how much room there is there, but I've only had to move uh, this second row forward just a touch to give me that space. So uh, I'm actually pretty impressed with that. Headroom is really good as well. So uh, USB-C over here, you've got two cup holders as well. Another USB-C over there, two more cup holders and then air vents down the bottom here too. So tell you what, I'm actually really surprised with this space. Uh, normally with these vehicles, the third row, you cannot fit adults in. Uh, what did we test recently that had a third row that wasn't built for adults? Oh, that's right, the Kia EV9. That thing is enormous on a big wheelbase as well. This has significantly more space, uh, but it typically means that you are then limited with boot space. So let's go check out how much you've got available in the boot. Okay, let's have a little look. So you have, according to Mazda, <laughs> that is so low. Even when that is pushed up, that is so low, that's bizarre. Um, so according to Mazda, there's around 600 litres of cargo space available here, including the space under the floor. and it's actually a really usable space because typically with these three row SUVs, they jam that third row up as far back as they can. And then you end up having no space here at all. This is actually not too bad. And also I love this off to the side, you have a power outlet as well, 150 watt and a 12 volt outlet too. And then beneath the cargo floor, you just have some of your recovery items. What else have we got under here? We've got a space saver spare under there as well. So yeah, not a bad uh, packaging effort. I'll show you what it looks like with our bags in here. So there's the laptop bag and here is the suitcase. So that'll fits perfectly fine, which is good news. Then what you can do is drop your third row out of the way by pulling this down, dropping that. That expands the space to around 1,100 litres. Again, 
really good space there in terms of storage and, and fairly flat load floor. If you do want to go the next step though, you can get rid of that second row too. That then gives you over 2,000 litres to work with, but it is an ascending floor there, so it doesn't sort of sit totally flat. So we've just hit the road in the CX-90 and as luck would have it, it has just bucketed down. So it's going to be very wet out there, but we'll see how we go anyway. Um, now, we did drive this as a pre-production car in petrol form, but haven't driven the diesel version of this, which is why I was excited to sort of pick the diesel and in a mid-spec as well. So I want to see what potentially the, the majority of people are actually going to be buying. So powering the diesel uh, is also a six cylinder, but this is a 3.3 litre turbocharged inline six cylinder uh, diesel engine, and it makes 187 kilowatts of power and 550 newton meters of torque, which is a pretty sort of generous amount. And you gotta remember that a lot of the vehicles in this segment have now downsized, or they've got a lot of emissions control equipment on them. And as a result of that, they're not actually all that interesting to drive. And I think what Mazda is aiming to do with this is bringing back that interesting to drive element. And that's all mated to an eight speed automatic transmission. It's an in-house transmission. It means that Mazda has developed this all on their own. Look, the transmission's okay. I don't love it. Uh, it can be sort of lazy at times. So you can actually catch it napping if you're driving along and sort of poke the throttle. And that to me, I think is just a, a sign of not so much cost cutting, but a company that perhaps doesn't know transmissions. And that's why a lot of manufacturers will go to a brand like ZF and get a transmission off the shelf that um, that is designed by a company that just does transmissions. But you do have the ability to control gear shifts here on the steering wheel using the paddle shifters, and that's actually not a bad system because it will then dive through the gears as required nice and quickly, and that's all sort of pretty responsive. And then in-gear acceleration is excellent too. When you get stuck into it, it really does punch you nicely in the back, and I think that is quite rewarding and something that you want from a vehicle in this segment. Now, let's talk about the thing I don't like. So I do like the engine, the way that it makes it feel, the punch in the back that you get, but I really dislike this stop-start system. And I'll show you what I mean first before I explain why. So there it is, it's off, and then comes back on, and it's able to switch itself off, uh, I think all the way to over 100 k's an hour. And it's great because when it is switched off, you're not using any fuel at all, and then it'll come back on and, and away you go. The system is designed entirely to operate the vehicle's electronic systems when it is switched off. It's a 48 volt mild hybrid system, and in layman's terms, it's basically there to keep all of those uh, systems that need a lot of electricity running when the car is switched off, which you typically can't do with a 12 volt system. So that's all great, but where it really falls down is when it is switching back on. When you are at a full stop and it switches back on, it's pretty nice and smooth, but right now when it's off, if I lean on the throttle, it then sort of jars the car a little bit and you end up getting this constant jerky motion as it comes in and out of gear when it's on and off. And to me, it just lacks the refinement of some of the European vehicles that have integrated starter generators. This really just needs a lot more work done to it. Even when you're approaching intersections at like 40 k's an hour, you're slowing down, it'll switch off. And when you go for the throttle, you then get this clunky effect of it not being in the right gear. And then you just end up jerking around and it just doesn't feel premium at all. So that is something they need to work on and I'm hoping that uh, over time they can actually develop a better software system to manage this uh, stop-start setup. Now, what does all that mean in terms of fuel economy? Well, Mazda claims a combined average of under six litres per 100 k's, uh, which I always thought was a bit ambitious for this. Uh, so let's have a look at how we're doing. Yeah, 7.7. 7. Uh, we have been doing a lot of driving earlier on today because of the rain, but the best I could see out of it was 6.9, and that was with pretty much all highway driving. So I think that claim of uh, 5.4, I think it is, it's just way too ambitious and pretty unrealistic. But having said that, that is actually not a bad figure to, to be actually hitting in a vehicle this size. It's just not the one that they claim. And just for those of you who are interested, the way that this stop-start system works, it actually plums energy when you're coasting or braking into a small 0.3 kilowatt hour battery. And that's all done through an 11 kilowatt uh, generator. It then has a small electric motor that's able to run both the vehicle and its systems when it is switched off. So you can do a light bit of throttle before the engine has to kick back on. It's just the way that it does. The whole kicking back on sequence isn't very good. Okay, time to check out our sine waves. We do this at 130 k's an hour. Whole purpose of this is to see what body control is like 
when speed picks up. There it is there. That is fantastic. They've done such a good job there with just getting the ride spot on for things like that. In and around the city, the, the ride can be a little bit firm, but it's nowhere near as bad as the CX-60. They really have gone to a lot more effort to refine the ride here. And then you get the benefits of excellent body control there as well, because it's able to just keep its body under check as it hits those uh, continuous undulations. And you're gonna experience stuff like that when you're out on a country road and you're trying to overtake. It is really good that they have dialed in all of the comfort levels required to, to have a suspension that actually works for Australian conditions. Okay, it's time for the worst road in Australia. We do this at 90 k's an hour. It's just an indication of a, a terrible country road. It's full of potholes and corrugations and just roughness. This is actually remarkably good. It still feels really comfortable here inside the car. These are our condensed sine waves. Shakes the living daylights out of the car but it is doing a remarkably good job here. They've done a great job with the ride. It is significantly better than the CX-60, which is just way too firm. This is right where it needs to be, very impressive. Now, I wanna run you through quickly this, this platform. It's quite interesting. So it's predominantly rear wheel drive. So it means that it actually sends all of its torque to the rear. Then it has a clutch pack that can pulse torque to the front axle. And that's different to a lot of all-wheel drives that are part-time because normally they're front-wheel drive and they only ever send torque to the rear when it's needed. This is the opposite. And it means you get that sort of rear-wheel drive effect behind the wheel, which I think is really a beneficial thing to have. In terms of your drive modes, you have sport, normal, and off-road. It is unfortunately sopping wet, so this is not going to be the fastest lap in the world, but let's go around our ride and handling track. So immediately I can feel the brakes don't have a really decent amount of feel through them. <laughs> there you go, I love that as well. So it has that, that rear wheel drive effect to it and it's just not something that you're used to in this segment because a lot of the vehicles in this segment are that front wheel drive type. So you really are getting a little bit of fun here behind the wheel and I can immediately actually feel those sporty connotations here. Like it really just wants to... Oh, it gives you a bit of body roll, it's kind of like um, a bit like an MX-5, the way they've programmed the feel in that. It gives you the body roll that you need, but it's very predictable. You know exactly what it's gonna do, and it never wants to spit you out and, and you know, leave you looking like a bad driver. So I really like that. Uh, I don't love the brake pedal feel. The pedal is very firm. And you don't really get the responsiveness. If you dive on it, it, it actually will pull up the vehicle perfectly fine, but it just feels a little bit firm for my liking. Same story with the steering. So here in sport mode, it is heavy, which I'm perfectly fine with, but even at low speeds, the steering is quite heavy as well. And I think that isn't the best thing in the world because you're gonna have families and, and I don't know, like my wife would drive this and uh, she's just not a fan of heavy steering. So I think that uh, that's probably something they need to work on as well. But as a driver's car, it is phenomenally good. It is wet now, but earlier when it was dry, we were able to have a fair bit of fun in this. And um, I think that they've done a great job in terms of the ride and handling package and, and just making it feel like a sporty SUV. And certainly up against the Euros, this actually does feel quite sporty. Now, road noise, uh, it is pretty quiet, especially uh, out on the freeway. Course ship roads, it's actually not that bad. This is the result we got with our calibrated sound meter, but do keep in mind that it is wet, so it is typically a little louder than what it would be if it was dry. So in terms of towing capacity, you have a 2,000 kilo brake towing capacity, but it's a bit of a furphy because you only have a maximum downbore weight of 150 kilos. So ideally, you don't want to be towing more than 1,500 kilos. Um, I mean, you can, but you just have to get the distribution right. So, yeah, look, it is a good, but not an amazing towing figure for a vehicle this size. Visibility, what's it like? Look, I can see clearly down the front of the car there, the wing mirrors are big, but the wing mirrors are a bit strange. Despite their size, they kind of are not great to see out of. Everything's really close. I just wish they could be a bit more wide angle given their size. And visibility out the rear is good. Keep in mind, if you do have that third row up, it will impede vision a little bit, but pretty impressed with how much vision there is actually out the back there. So let's do some performance testing. Uh, before we get into that, I just wanted to tell you about Help Me Car Expert. It's by by our friends at CarWow. Uh, we're actually a big company, Car Expert. Uh, it's not just us guys filming stuff here. 
Uh, we've got like over 50 full-time employees and we have a stack of vetted dealers on our books that are vetted to get you the best deal and the best customer experience. So if you do want a car like this that's in stock uh, or one that isn't in stock yet but you want a good deal on it, just go to Google and type in help me car expert and that will connect you with our dealers and give you a bit of an idea of exactly what we do. Now, in terms of the actual performance numbers, uh, what we're gonna do here is go from zero all the way through to 120, and that'll give us an idea of what this is like in terms of overtaking as well as just zero to 100. It is unfortunately wet outside, but uh, we'll see how we go anyway. And um, yeah, let's give it a crack. I've turned track control off as well, so here we go. Yeah, nice and solid off the line there. Alrighty. There's 100, and there's 120. All righty, we'll pull it up. So zero to 100, 8.26 seconds. So not too bad, not too sort of uh, amazing. And then 80 to 120, 5.28 seconds. So that figure's actually pretty good when you consider that uh, 80 to 120 is gonna be things like overtaking. Oh, I think that's actually a pretty healthy number. Let's head back and do a break from 100. Kind of pointless given it's so wet, but we'll give it a shot anyway. Okie dokie, so we'll get this up to 100, hit the anchors, it is wet, but anyway. All right. Oh, so 100 to zero, 3.74 seconds and 54 meters. So yeah, not the best stopping time in the world or the stopping distance, but it is what it is. If you do want to see how this compares to other cars that we've tested before, have a look at the link in the description below. Keep in mind that it is wet, you know, which is going to affect the way this stops. If it does dry up, we're going to try and get ourselves another time. Okay, time for our reverse acceleration test. Here we go. Not bad. 50 kilometers an hour. So the Mazda CX-90, what do we reckon? Finally had a chance to drive a proper one and actually spend some time with it as a family car. And I came away with it uh, with mixed emotions, right? So I think it is expensive and this is certainly more palatable than the 90, $100,000 version that you can actually get. I think this is probably the sweet spot in the range in terms of features and, and uh, price as well. But it is inherently let down by that stop-start system. It isn't very good at all. Um, I'm also a little disappointed with the fuel economy. It's, it's good, but it's still nowhere near the Mazda claim. And I'd love to know what they did to actually achieve that type of fuel economy. And uh, finally, I just think some of those materials aren't really reflective of a vehicle of that price. But if you park those things for a second, it has a stack of room inside and as a family car it actually has pretty much everything that you need in a package that isn't big and daunting and that is extremely fun to drive if you find yourself on a twisty mountain road so if the price is palatable to you and you don't mind the materials and stuff that they've used inside the cabin i'd probably be leaning towards the diesel over the petrol version just given how efficient it is how punchy it is and and how fun it is to drive as well so let me know in the comments section below, have you bought one of these? What's it like to live with? Are you looking at one? Are you daunted by the price? Let me know your thoughts. I'm always keen to see what people think about models like this that try and change the game for a brand. If you did enjoy this video, please make sure you like it and you share it with your mates. And if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon. But until next time, take it easy.